This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. Wide broadcast. I'm Katie Larson, and in this hour, we are exploring stepping up the pace cure. It's 9 a.m. It's 9:08 here in Melbourne. It's 10:08 in London, and 5:08 in New York. We are going around the world today on Joy 94.9. You can join the global conversation by emailing on air at joy.org.au. Or you can join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag JoyWAD. If you want to watch us online, you can do so. WorldAidsDayWorldwide.org is the URL and you can see what we're doing here today at Joy94.9. Now, today, this morning, we're going to be talking in, in the next hour about cure. And I think it's pretty exciting that in this con conversation about HIV and AIDS, we are now in a place where we are starting to talk about cure. To help me and you understand more about where we're at and where we're going when it comes to cure, I am joined by two guests this morning. Firstly, we will be talking to Rowena Johnston, who is Vice President and Director of Research at AMFAR um, and is responsible for overseeing that foundation's pioneer, pioneering research program in protection in particular around prevention, treatment and cure. Rowena will be joining us live via Skype uh, uh, from New York City, which is very exciting. In the studio, I'm also very happy to be joined by Professor Sharon Lewin, who is the Professor and Head of the Department of Infectious Diseases at the Alfred Hospital and Monash University, not to mention a few other roles as well. Thank you for joining us today, Sharon. Good morning, thank you. And thank you for joining us today, Rowena, are you there? Yes, thanks for having me. Ah, the wonders of modern technology. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Uh, with us if that's fantastic. Um, look, to start us off, I just thought, I mean, for, for me, I just want to hear a little bit more about what does it mean to talk about cure with HIV and AIDS? Where are we at? Uh, is this something we're looking at, at seeing soon? And, and how is the process going? Sharon, if I can start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, cure is a, is a word that means different things to different people. Mm. So as I'm sure many of your listeners know, we've got excellent treatments for HIV, um, antiretroviral drugs. When people start those medic medicines, the virus rapidly disappears from the blood mm. and the immune system recovers, but treatment needs to be lifelong. Yep. And as soon as people stop treatment, usually within about a month, the virus pops back up. Okay. So when we talk about cure, we really are talking about ways that people could perhaps not need to take lifelong treatment. Mm. They could stop treatment and the virus could stay under control. So they may need to take four or five years of antiretrovirals and then could stop the drugs and the virus is still there but under control. Mm. So you, you, it, an easier way to think about it might be to think about it as in, in remission, might we think perhaps of okay. cancer. And some people call that a functional cure. Mm. And most of the people working in the field think that a functional cure is probably going to be more easily achieved than a true sterilizing cure where you wipe out every mm. bit, last bit of HIV, someone's HIV negative, no detection of the virus, which is how we commonly think about curing infectious diseases. Rowena, where, where um, at AMFAR, can you tell us a little bit about the research that AMFAR is doing and, and what cure means in terms of the work you're doing there? Yeah, um, I'd love to. AMFAR has actually been funding cure research for, for over 10 years now. And back in the day, you know, Sharon alluded to this too, people didn't really used to think that a cure for HIV is possible. Mm. It's a viral disease and normally you don't cure a viral disease. I'm Normally either your immune system clears it out or it's a lifelong infection. There's one exception now, hepatitis C, and maybe we'll be able to learn something from that. But we started funding cure research um, quite a long time ago because our mission really is to bring an end to AIDS. And we see that that really has to come about two ways. We need a way that we can prevent all new infections from happening, and then we need a way to cure the people who are already infected. And we have really actually made some really nice progress in the last six or seven years or so. You're probably aware that the first man to be cured of HIV actually was already reported on in 2009 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And we, for a long time, referred to him as the Berlin patient. Uh, we now know that his name is Timothy Brown. He was a man living in Berlin who had HIV, but then also acquired a cancer that needed to be treated by stem cell transplantation. And he received a stem cell transplant from a donor who had a particular genetic mutation that then actually cleared out not only his cancer, but all his, also his HIV. And again, the way Sharon was referring to, we, we do believe that he's cured because he hasn't been taking antiretroviral therapy for these last six years or so. 
and there's been no rebound in his virus. And so, of course, as soon as that case happened, researchers got very excited and very optimistic about the possibility of, of being able to cure HIV infection after all. I think it would be really hard to overstate you know, just how important that case was to mobilize scientists into thinking, you know what, we might be able to cure this thing. And then earlier this year, we had the report of a Mississippi baby that was cured of HIV infection. Um, we also have reports from France from people whose virus has not been eradicated. But again, the way Sharon had alluded to, these are people who no longer have to take antiretroviral therapy. And it would appear so far that they're not going to suffer the ill consequences that we normally associate with um, HIV. So, you know, AMFAR, you know, we're really ramping up our... Um, our funding of cure research, and we're really excited to see the optimism that we think the scientific community is sharing now. And in terms of the scientific community working towards cure, how much of a collaborative process is it? So um, would you be, say, Sharon, working with someone like Rowena on a constant basis, or is it more about going away and looking at different options and then coming together as a community at something like the conference which is happening next year and, and then talking about an information sharing in that space? Yeah, I, I think um, you know finding a cure is complex and it's unlikely it's going to come from one laboratory, one company or even one country. And um, over the last few years, there have been quite a few initiatives to get collaborative groups together. And yeah. that, I think that's really the way forward in all big issues in science, big teams working collaboratively. Of course, we're all in competition as well. <laughs> yes. That's what drives science. I was alluding to that a little bit, <laughs> but I wasn't going to say it directly. <laughs> but collaborative competition. And, and I should say AMFA was... Um, uh, and uh, uh, many of your listeners may not know, it's American Foundation for AIDS Research. It was one of the first funders that sort of promoted this idea of collaborative research, and Rowena might want to talk about that in a moment. But other initiatives have been in place. So the National Institutes of Health, back in 2011, committed $75 million to cure research, and the goal of that was to, get to develop collaborative groups that they call co-laboratories mm -hmm. that included both public and private partners and uh, the NIH ended up funding three big groups or three co-laboratories. The three of them are headed in the US but my lab as well as the lab of Sarah Palmer, a scientist up in Sydney, are both two non-US based scientists part of one of the large co-laboratories coming out of San Francisco. And I think um, and Rowena will speak about other collaborations, but I, from my own personal experience, we collaborate with many, many, many groups. And I think that's the way to go in science. That's the way to go yeah. for tackling a really big problem. And I think over the next few years, we're going to see more and more of these collaborative groups. There are similar ones forming in France, across Europe, across the UK. Um, another collaborative group that I'm a part of uh, which is funded through NHMRC and NHMRC, what we call a program grant that involves investigators from both Sydney and Melbourne, um, six or seven groups working together as well. Mm. Rowena, just um, uh, Sharon mentioned there that the AMFAR was instrumental in that collaborative process. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and also how the collaboration works from your end? Yeah, we recognised a few years ago, as Sharon said, this is so complex that there's no single person who could possibly come up with the answer. But, the, you know, uh, you know it, it's a fair question because scientists really are in competition with each other. It's human nature. Everybody wants to be first to make the big finding. Yep. And so we kind of had to think creatively about how do we get scientists together because we do believe that science works best when people get together and really share their ideas. So we came up with the AMFAR Research Consortium on HIV Eradication, which we call ARCH, um, where we actually proactively... I think we're just having just having a little issue with the Skype there, Rowena. I'll just get you to pause for a second, and um, I will just come back to Sharon if I can ask you. Um, just moving away from the conversation about for a moment, um, the conference that we're July 2014 is the 20th International AIDS Conference being held here in Melbourne. Um, it is very exciting in terms of information gathering, research sharing. Uh, why why is it so important that this conference continues to happen and what impact does it have internationally? 
Yeah, the International AIDS Conference has been going since the beginning of the epidemic. This is the 20th International AIDS Conference. Mm. I'm going to be the local co-chair and co-chairing it with Francoise Barasinoussi, the international co-chair and president of the International AIDS Society and the discoverer of HIV, of course, and won the Nobel Prize. So um, I'm very excited to be able to co-chair it with someone of that eminence. What's unique about this conference is it's far more than a scientific meeting. It has three main programs, science, community and leadership. And I think the main goal of the conference is to create dialogue amongst those three main pillars of the HIV Mm -hmm. response. And in the past, that dialogue has been instrumental in major, major changes Mm -hmm. because scientists can't lead those changes alone, community can't lead them alone, and Lead, and government can't lead them alone. And so when you work together, you you get the synergies of those partnerships and hopefully practical action and outcomes. So to give you a few examples of what I see as the you know really successful conferences, um, the ones that come to mind are, of course, 1996, when the conference was held in Vancouver, yeah. and it was the first announcement of antiretroviral oh, therapy. Right. Enormous excitement yeah. in the community. Of course, that was a great scientific advance, but it had a major impact on community and, of course, major impact on policy. Um, The other conference that comes to mind of having an incredible legacy was Durban in 2000. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time the conference had been in Africa and it shone the spotlight on the enormity of the problem in Africa that Mm. I don't think the rest of the world understood and that people were still dying there while antiretroviral therapy was available in 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 the Western world. And that mobilised um, an incredible response and um, uh, initiative to get companies to reduce prices, make um, uh, drugs available in low-income countries, and and revolutionised um, uh, the the epidemic in particularly in low-income countries. It's a really interesting point about lower-income countries, and particularly Africa, which has been so devastated by HIV and AIDS. Um, in terms of speaking about a cure, um, and what we know we've seen with antiretrovirals, they are more available, as I understand, in, in the developed world than they are in those countries, and it has been a process to start making access to that treatment, creating access to that treatment. Is it? Uh, are we at a stage in thinking about cure in terms of trying to understand how we can... Uh, give access not only to the more developed nations, but also really reaching those nations where there is such devastating impact of HIV and AIDS and how quickly we can do that. Is it is it purely a financial process or is there some thinking about how we do that moving forward? Yeah, just going back a bit, um, it's uh, really important for people to understand what great successes we've seen in low income countries. Mm -hmm. So we have 10 million people now on treatment last year in low income countries. that's depending on on, on, on the, the view on when to start treatment. That's about 34% of people mm. who need it. So that's an incredible um, advance given, given back in 2000. We had almost no one. And that's been possible due to changes in licensing laws, um, availability of generic drugs and reducing the cost of antiretroviral therapy. And most people back in 2000 thought too hard. You know, a, a country with a stretched healthcare system could never imagine, yeah. could never manage something so complex. Yeah. And of course, they've been proved incredibly, proved wrong. You know, some countries like Botswana have 80% of people who need treatment on treatment, or as good as Australia. So yeah. incredible success stories. And um, I think we've learned a lot from that lesson. We've learned that from whatever we develop, whatever great breakthroughs happen, we must make them available to the developing world and low-income countries. And I think that's very much in the forefront of people's thinking. But we sort of haven't got to... St- we haven't really got to step one yet. We've had some baby steps of success, which R- Rowena um, described earlier, of s- success stories, meaning that there's a belief and understanding um, and uh, uh, people are convinced that, that cure is possible. Mm. We still need to make many more steps to have an intervention that will help most people, even in high-income countries. And the whole time we need to be thinking about how we're going to make that available to everyone who needs it. Mm. But I think the science still needs to take a lot of steps forward. The research at at this point in time is quite complicated because we're still trying to understand 
how the whole thing works, how the virus hides, how to get it out of hiding. It's kind of fancy high-tech science that, of course, many countries can do, but we need to get those initial scientific breakthroughs first, investing in discovery, investing in partnerships with pharmaceutical companies. and But at the same time, a, a, a high level of awareness that a cure, well, in my mind, a cure that's going to be available to wealthy people in Seattle who can pay for a transplant or some fancy form of gene therapy is not the kind of cure that we want to ultimately see. But we may have to go through those steps first. Rowena, I believe you're, you are back with us now. Is there any sort of further comment that you can make or you'd like to make around this particular issue of how we create, uh, I suppose, really good access to cure when it is found? I think it's a really interesting and important question. And we know, you know, as Sharon said, when antiretroviral therapy was first developed, people did think it was too complex and too expensive to implement in the, the hardest hit region of the world, which is Africa. But if we look at it from the opposite angle, it's almost a question of whether we can afford not to do this, because it's great news that we have a lot of a lot more people in Africa taking antiretroviral therapy. We know that that's going to prolong lives. We also, by the way, know that if you're taking antiretroviral therapy, you're less likely to transmit to others. And so not only is it a treatment advantage, it's also a prevention advantage. So we're decreasing the number of new infections by virtue of the fact that more people are on antiretroviral therapy. But antiretroviral therapy is, is kind of expensive. And right now we're depending on the generosity of international donors to make sure that those regions of the world that are a little bit poorer can actually afford to provide their people with antiretroviral therapy. And it's really not realistically a long-term plan because we can't really be sure that donors will always be there and always be willing to pay what it costs to be able to treat these increasing numbers of people who are living longer with HIV. You know, the great news is that antiretroviral therapy is allowing people to live longer. From the funding perspective, what this means is we have more people to whom we have to provide antiretroviral therapy. If we had a cure for those people, we really need to start thinking also about how cost saving that is, that if you could get people off antiretroviral therapy, even if a cure is relatively expensive, if you compare that to the lifetime cost of antiretroviral therapy, I really do end up, I do think it will end up um, being something that hopefully funders will agree with us that, that it's really worth our while to implement whatever the cure might be. And you know, let's also face it, it might be that the first type of cure we come up with is something quite fancy and quite expensive. And then it will be the job of people who were able to implement technologies. You know, everything once it's been invented can always be made cheaper. And I, you know, I think there are people who specialize in that kind of thing. I suspect that that's the kind of situation we're going to end up with. I think we're going to end up with something that's probably expensive and complicated. And then it will be the job of others to work out how do we make this simpler? How do we make it cheaper? How do we get it to everybody out there who needs it? Thank you. And look, we are we are talking about uh, stepping up the pace and cure here on Joy 94.9 World's AJ Worldwide Broadcast. We've had a couple of comments in tweet from Friends for Africa. Every, 50, every hour, 50 young people are infected with HIV in Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, another tweet, this is from Kyle H. This is important. This means that an AIDS-free future is possible, which is absolutely critical and, and certainly what we're talking about here this morning. Um, and also a tweet from uh, Andrew. Thinking of friends, let's hope for a cure soon we have come so far. I am speaking uh, in this hour with Professor Sharon Lewin and Rowena Johnston. Uh, Rowena joining me on Skype from New York City and Sharon in the studio with me. We are, go we are going to head off to a short break shortly but we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about Cure of course um, but also um, the conference that's happening in Melbourne next year. If you want to join the conversation please do email on air at joy.org.au or Twitter you can contact us hashtag joywad or you can watch us online worldsadayworldwide.org you are on joy94.9 for our World's A Day Worldwide broadcast. Thank you for joining us this morning we'll be back shortly. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. You are on Joy 94.9 for the World AIDS Day Worldwide broadcast. Thank you for joining me. I'm Katie Larson. Uh, we are continuing in this hour to talk about stepping up the pace cure, and I am very happy to be joined in the studio by Professor Sharon Lewin and also Rowena Johnston to help us out in finding out a little bit more about Cure. I'll just remind you again, if you want to join the conversation with us here this morning, uh, you can email on air at joy.org.au or you can tweet hashtag joy WAD and uh, WAD, I should say. And you can also watch us online at World AIDS Day 
worldwide.org. Uh, now, Sharon, before we, we will talk more about Cure, um, but I'm just interested in finding out a little bit more about what's happening with the conference. It's happening in Melbourne next year, AIDS 2014. It's a 20th International AIDS Conference, and it is the premier gathering for all the big players in terms of talking about HIV and AIDS. Um, what have, I guess, going into this year, it, the, the theme is stepping up the pace. So what does that mean? mean? Why was that theme chosen for the conference for next year? Yeah, the theme was chosen because there's a feeling uh, that we're at a critical time in the AIDS epidemic. Critical time when we know what works. And if we could get out what works into communities effectively, we can have a dramatic impact on the epidemic. And that's the reason for that, um, there are multiple reasons for that. The first is that uh, antiretroviral treatment not only prolongs the life of the person taking the drugs, it dramatically reduces their infectiousness. Mm -hmm. So the more people who we can treat, the less virus there will be circulating in the community. We have many examples of this now from actually parts of South Africa, from um, parts of Canada, that if we can increase the uptake of treatment, we can have a dramatic effect on transmission. Can I just pause you there for a second? So that is one of the issues we're having in, uh, I believe, in, in say, in Australia, is, is actually the uptake of uh, treatment and testing. Is that, is that right? Yeah, um, there, are, there are a few drivers for increasing um, for, for new infections. Um, in Australia, we actually have pretty good uptake of treatment, but we yet we are seeing increases in infections, mm. largely in men who have sex with men and young men who have sex with men. Mm. And most transmissions are probably occurring from people who don't know their status. Mm. So there's a number of ways that we need to that you need to tackle transmission through treatment. The first is that people get tested, know their status, access treatment and stay on treatment. Mm. And there's a whole lot of work to do along that pathway. But getting back to the idea of stepping up the pace, um, if we invest now in attacking that pathway, also going back a bit, getting people tested, getting them into treatment, getting them, getting them into care, getting them on treatment and staying on treatment, if we accelerate that whole pathway, we can have a very dramatic effect on numbers of new infections. Mm. We know that treating mother, infected mothers will potent, effectively eliminate transmission to their babies. But yet in many parts of the world, only it's Asia, for example, only 30% of women who are pregnant actually get tested for HIV. Only 16% of women actually get the treatment. So again, we know what works. Give women antiretroviral therapy and we won't transmit, we will eliminate transmission to babies. And there's a real urgency now to implement what works. Um, and we could then have a potentially an AIDS-free generation. If you really have effective health care systems that diagnose women with HIV when they're pregnant, give them treatment when they're pregnant, we'll, we can indeed eliminate transmission to babies. So I think there's an urgency at the moment. We certainly want to not enter a complacent state and complacency could see a resurgence of new infections. Yeah. Is that an um, interested, uh, Rowena, in the situation in the United States? We know we're seeing an increase in um, diagnosis of HIV uh, in Australia, particularly with men who have sex with men. Is that a similar scenario in the United States, Rowena? Yeah, unfortunately it is. And the irony is, you know, as you probably know, the United States spends more than any other country in the world per person on health care. And yet we are seeing, you know, what Sharon was referring to is this treatment cascade where people, you know, there's a whole series of steps that people have to take. They have to get tested. If they test positive, they should enter into medical care. If they enter into medical care, they should get antiretroviral therapy and so on through the cascade until you get to a point where the HIV infection is actually under very good control. Mm. And in the United States, it's actually only about 23% of all HIV positive people who fit in that category of having HIV that's very well under control because every step along that path, we're losing people. We're not catching people, the people we need to catch in terms of getting them to get tested. Even if they are tested, they might not be entering into medical care. If they're not, if they are entering into medical care, they might not be adhering to their antiretroviral therapy, et cetera. And so it really comes back to this need. You know, there's, I, you know, I share this sense of frustration because mm. the reason we're all doing this scientific research is because we want to make a difference in the lives of the people who are infected or affected by HIV. And that really only works when you can make the new scientific findings 
And then you share those findings with the peers and, and confirm that these findings are true. And, the, you know, the really important third arm of this effort is that we need to implement what it is that the science has shown us. That's where you really get your bang for the buck, if you pardon that expression, for when you do scientific research. That's why we're all in this, you know. And there is this sense of frustration because there are a lot of things that we know work. For example, you know, what Sharon didn't mention, syringe exchange programs. Lots of politicians are very squeamish about syringe exchange, and yet we know it's incredibly effective at reducing the amount of HIV transmission between injection drug users. But no matter how much it seems, no matter how much science we're able to produce that demonstrates that it is effective in terms of reducing HIV and transmission, but also does not increase the use of drugs by people who are not using drugs or people who even are using these drugs. It, it doesn't have harmful effects. It does have beneficial effects. And yet it can be very difficult to convince those people who need convincing that this is an effective program to implement so that we can keep getting these HIV numbers lower. How does it work in terms of, um, I mean, I can understand the frustration in terms of having these scientific outcomes and, and knowing we can make a difference and then seeing rates increase. How does that translate on uh, an international scale in some of those developing countries uh, and particularly in Africa? Do we, is there a case of seeing an uptake and engaging with communities and a real commitment to creating change or is there sort of, are there blocks there as well that are impacting on that process? Sharon, if I can start with you. Yeah, I think there um, are some great success stories in Africa and other low-income countries of implementing good testing policies, good treatment policies. And in fact, last year, there were 25 countries that had a 50% reduction in new HIV infections, and over half of them were in Africa. Mm -hmm. So on many parameters, um, the response is highly effective. But then we have areas where we're not doing as well mm. and um, a lot of data now is coming out on particular um, hot spots of infection where we really need to focus our efforts mm. or um, and they're largely in what we call key affected populations manual sex with men people who inject drugs sex workers um, prisoners transgender people they're in we're seeing much higher yeah. rates in these key affected populations and we've talked a little bit about implementing the science, you know, the medical model, but there's much more. The, 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 um, an effective response is not just medicalising HIV. The reason why in many countries effective healthcare can't reach the people who need it is because of stigma and discrimination mm. and, you know, an epidemic of um, discriminatory laws and a legal environment that um, discourages people to be... Um, access healthcare, mm -hmm. and uh, we still have many countries where um, homosexuality is uh, is a criminal offence. Mm -hmm. Where injecting drug use is um, is heavily criminalised. Where where people who inject drugs can't access appropriate healthcare, um, and and those are big drivers of the epidemic as well. So we've got to ad address many of those factors. So yes, there are many countries that are doing really well, which is which is fantastic. Is a great that's the great success story. Mm -hmm. But many areas that are that are sort of being left behind, and the solutions to that is getting medications out, but it's also fixing these um, systemic issues, systemic problems in policy and law that actually limit people accessing the treatment they need. Rowena, is that that the situation as as you said as well, and certainly is that what you're finding in your work with Ampharm? Yeah, in fact, um, you know, especially in places in Asia and in Africa, for example. Um, we find that the prevalence of HIV among gay men is as high as 20 times as high as it is in the general population. And yet these, some of these are the exact areas where the country representatives, for example, don't believe that there's such a thing as gay people in their country, or homosexuality is very stigmatized, and so people don't feel safe coming forward and going to the doctor and saying, you know, could I get an HIV test, because they don't want to come under immediate suspicion of being gay. You know, it's this vicious circle where... It's a frustration, you know. We know how we would be able to deal with this, but we can't get to reach the people we need to reach. And the same goes for um, injection drug use, which is a big driver of the epidemic in Eastern Europe. And I, heavily stigmatized and criminalized. And those people who need the services do fear literally for their lives uh, if they come forward for services. Right. I've had a, we've got a couple of tweets coming through, which is great. Um, 
Uh, firstly, a festive one. While everyone is decorating their Christmas trees today, I hope they are also decorating themselves with a little red ribbon. That mm -hmm. is from Myron, and of course we are all wearing the red ribbons at Joy here today. And also from Sin, our fellow community radio station in Melbourne, who are congratulating us on the Global World Aid Day broadcast. Thank you to all of those that are listening and joining us as part of the conversation today. I've had a couple of questions come through as well from Steve in Melbourne, who's asked, once a cure is found, how long will it take to mass produce it and deploy it to where it is needed? We've talked about that a little bit, but I guess what would be interesting to also f hear more about is is what actually might cure HIV. And Rowena, if, 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 is there anything you can add to that? Yeah, I think how fast we can get a cure out to people really depends on what the cure is. And we don't have a good sense of that right now. What I think is interesting, though, and it hadn't occurred to me, maybe it had occurred to smarter people than me, I guess a few years ago it hadn't occurred to me that there might be different cures for different people. But what we're seeing from the from the successes that we've had so far, we've had one guy cured through a stem cell transplant. We've had an infant cured through very early treatment with antiretroviral therapies, much sooner than an infant normally would get. And we have these people in France who have a different type of a cure, but it also came through relatively early treatment. I mean, we just don't know. The, there are three main ways in which people are looking to cure HIV right now. One is gene therapy. One is immune therapy, maybe some kind of vaccination or boosting of the immune system. And the third is, you know, pharmacology, taking a pill of some kind. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, how fast we can deploy the cure is going to depend a lot on which one of those or which combination of those things actually ends up being the most effective. I think, you know, it's not going to come as a great surprise if it ends up being gene therapy, at least as the first cure that comes through, that's going to be very difficult to implement. Gene therapy... I think everybody knows enough about gene therapy to know that it's a very complicated, very high-tech and very expensive procedure. Um, that would be something that really would be difficult to implement. Maybe around, you know, even in places like Australia or the United States, it would be kind of difficult. If it were a pill, for example, um, you know, then again, it depends on the pill. It's an expensive pill, a cheap pill, but it, obviously dispensing pills around the world is going to be something that's a lot easier for us to do. Sharon, is um, that something that's being taken into consideration in the development of a cure is, is looking at the cost and how easy, the, well, not easy, but how we might make it more accessible internationally rather than sort of getting the result first, actually trying to spend more time getting a result that is going to be able to impact on more people's lives? Yeah, I think um, cost effectiveness is an important area to um, model. Um, we haven't talked about this yet, but the International Aid Society have, um, who are the, the sort mm. of custodian of the conference, have got a very one of their key um, goals is is you know accelerating the path towards a cure, and under their program, um, which is actually chaired by Francoise Barros, and you see they have a group looking exactly at this cost effectiveness mm. because, as Rowena explained earlier, y you know we can't just say something expensive will be bad. You have to you have as in something expensive is not feasible. We have to weigh it up against lifelong yep. treatment, lifelong access and use of healthcare services, lifelong potential side effects of long-term antiretroviral therapy. So the modeling, a lot of work is now being done on modeling, not much to date, um, but I think the, some initial modeling that came out of the US suggested that we don't need a cure that's, when we think about vaccines, we want a vaccine that's under a dollar. You know, that's mm -hmm. a sort of goal for many of the vaccines. A cure might be different. A cure of, 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 of a lot, um, which costs a lot more than that, could be cost effective given that you're balancing it up against lifelong treatment. We, I think we need to do more work on, on understanding the dollars there. I'm interested um, with both of you, obviously, uh, in your role as scientists and researchers, um, but the, in terms of your personal interest and why you've decided to work in this space, um, it's really interesting to always hear what uh, drives people to, to do their work. Um, so, Rowena, I, if I can start with you, I believe, despite the accent, that there is an Australian connection in there as well, if you can talk <laughs> hey, to I'm a that. Sydney girl. <laughs> <laughs> you don't sound like a <laughs> Sydney a girl anymore. Anyway. <laughs> I revealed it, Rowena, sorry. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about um, what, I guess, what's driven you to do this work and also how, you, uh, how and why you came to be in New York City doing that? Wow, <laughs> that's a longer story. <laughs> in, you know, in, a, I, in a brief format. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start with, you know, what I think is really interesting about Cure. Um, I actually, my training, and this is partly how I came to New York too, my training as a scientist is actually in Parkinson's disease, and I switched fields entirely about 12 years ago when I started at Amphar, and I moved into HIV. 
And it was probably a naive belief at the time, but I really scratched my head and wondered, why aren't we talking about curing this? Isn't that what people who work in foundations about diseases, isn't that what you want to do? You want to cure the disease that you're working in. And, you know, we had a lot of um, flack, you know, come back at that when we decided to kind of go forth with that whole cure agenda, which is when I started learning more about, you know, some of the reasons people are skeptical about finding a cure for HIV. But to me, you know, this is such an interesting, you know, I don't want to belittle what people are going through who are in HIV, but I find this virus so fascinating. I find, you know, this is a kind of a one of a kind virus, essentially, that infects humans. It's it's about the most complicated virus I can imagine being able to cure. And so to me, it's just really a, it's a, a mission, you know, I mean, we have to, you know, I don't want a virus to be smarter than me. I want to work out how are we going to cure this thing because I just refuse to believe that it, it's not possible. I want to be around. I want to understand it. I want to get us there. I want, you know, I want, I want to be part of curing HIV because this is really just the most enormous scientific challenge that I'm aware of at the moment in, in biology. Rowena, before we come to um, Sharon with this question, I just wanted to um, interject with another question that's come through from Brendan in Auckland, um, particularly to you, um, saying you said there needed to be two cures, one to prevent infection and one to cure those already infected. Um, basically, he's asked, hard question, but which is more important? We're, we get it, we're getting pretty short on time, so if I can get a, a relatively brief answer, but if you can um, address that, that would be great. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I really don't know that either of them is more important. Obviously, ideally, we want to prevent new infections and we want to cure the people who are infected. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a little bit circular. We want to prevent infections so that there are fewer people who need to be cured. But we are, we do continue to accrue new infections. And so we continue to accrue more people who need to be cured. Um, you know, it, and just importantly, you know, we do have a number of ways of, of preventing HIV infection, even in the absence of a vaccine. I mean, we have condoms and syringe exchange and prevention of mother to child transmission, antiretroviral therapy. We have a lot of these things that could be implemented even in the absence of a vaccine. All we don't have right now is a cure that we can, even, you know, even any practical cure that we can put out to different populations. So, you know, certainly that's where my interest is. Right. Thank you. Now, Sharon, just coming back to you in just terms of your, I mean, interest in and, and drive in terms of why you're doing the work you do and, and what drives you personally. Well, I started um, working in HIV in the early 90s when I was training as a specialist uh, physician here at the Alfred and Royal Melbourne Hospital and Fairfield Hospitals. And at that time in the early 90s, you know, HIV was a, a, a devastating illness with no treatment, an incredible stigma and discrimination and a whole lot of unknowns, um, sort of scientific, medical and social sort of challenges. And so that mix has always been a great, um, great appeal to me. I like the, I, I find the, ho the science fascinating. I'm a geek really by <laughs> background, but that's really my, my real passion. And the science has just changed so much in just my own career. It's an incredibly dynamic area scientifically, but the medicine is fascinating. And then the intersection with all the social um, aspects of HIV, I, 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 I really enjoy that mix. And then I went and did my um, postdoc actually in New York with David Ho in the late 90s, which was just after the discovery of antiretroviral therapy. And in the first few years, people thought that antivirals alone would cure HIV because um, the virus disappears so quickly from blood. And the first thing I worked on in the late 90s was seeing where the virus was hiding um, and ways we could measure it in people who had an undetectable viral load. Mm. And of course, we were, tr we were proven wrong very quickly by 99, showing that um, there were these long-lived persistent reservoirs of virus and anyone who stopped treatment of the virus came straight back up. So um, my involvement in this area goes back to the late 90s. Um, I think over the next decade, there was a lot of focus on other more pressing issues in the HIV arena, yeah. getting better drugs, getting them out to people, a lot of focus on vaccine research, a lot of focus on understanding in the immune recovery after antivirals. Um, and that's really, I think that that makes sense to me. And so, but now in this decade, um, where we have got ex excellent antiretrovirals, we've sort of come back to this core question as Rowena said you know ultimately you want to cure the disease so um, I am uh, fascinated by the science um, energized by the potential impact something like this could happen 
Um, I really, I, I, I also um, very much enjoy working in the HIV arena um, because I think of so, so much of the benefits have come through effective advocacy, largely, largely driven by the community. And so I think we're going to keep seeing successes. Um, look, it's a complicated issue and obviously we've talked about the fact that there are lots of different directions this can go in, but um, just in the interest of, you know, keeping it simple, how long till we've got a cure for HIV and AIDS? <laughs> <laughs> and I know that's a difficult one to answer, but just briefly, do, can you give us any indication, either of you, um, uh, and Sharon, I'll start with you, if um, of how long we might be looking at or what we, we is it in our lifetime that we would expect to see a fully functional cure for HIV and AIDS? Well, my favourite response to that question is, I'm a scientist, not a fortune teller. <laughs> so I don't I think... They were the <laughs> <laughs> I think we're the um, I think we're going to see uh, examples of functional cure um, in a few people, uh, in a minority of people, over the next few years, as we have seen in the past few years. I think a cure that's scalable and available to all who need it is going to take a much, much longer time, and that's really what we're working towards. It's a, it's a long-term aspirational goal here. Thank you both to, uh, to both of you so much for joining us, Professor Sharon Lewin from the Alfred and Monash University, and Rowena Johnston, who is Head of Research at AMFAR. It's been wonderful to have you both today and absolutely commend you on the work you're doing and, um, and wish you all the best for your future work. Thank you also to everyone that's listening on Joy 94.9 World AIDS Day worldwide broadcast. We're having a lot of tweets and questions come in. We're getting to as many of them as we can. And uh, in the next hour, we're going to where are we headed funding where does it come from and where does it go with Glenn? I'm, I'm Katie Larson. I'll be back at 9pm to discuss uh, women and girls. You are once again listening to Joy 94.9, World's A Day, World Bright Broadcast. We will speak to you again very shortly. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning.